Hey, welcome to episode five of the Employee to Entrepreneur podcast. I'm joined today by my friend and mentor, Bruno, Bruno Nwogu. I like to call him uh, the sales king of Nigeria. He's got a large following on Twitter, and he has his own program now called the Community of Closers, where he walks people and teaches people how to be remote, how to do remote sales and how to be remote closers. So, Bruno, thanks for joining me today. That is all mine, Ryan. That is all mine. How you doing, brother? Doing great, man. Doing great. Um, so you have a great um, Twitter thread pinned to your profile that t- talks about kind of your journey um, from where, like, you, you know, you kind of started and realized that you wanted to do something else with your life to where you are now. And obviously, I'm pretty familiar with it. But for the sake of the audience, can you tell us that story? Okay, so um, I'm just I'm going to make it as as brief as possible because we probably don't have all the time together. So um, sure. the story begins in 2020. I mean, it begins way before then, but the real story actually starts in 2020. So I, I'm working in the gym and I'm in uh, I'm a customer care rep in a gym and I'm being paid like 40,000 naira. Now for the foreign audiences, that's about less than a hundred dollars now. And as a den, it was about a hundred dollars. And also I was being paid as a, 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 a you know, take home salary. And now, Sorry, that was my that was a salary. By the time you deduct expenses, you know, feeding, what's left was about twenty dollars. So um, um, I mean, I like the job because I was I had the opportunity to meet with like you know, uh, rich people, and I felt like you know they were going to help me. They were going to be you know change my life. You know, help me connect me something like that. And I had it all wrong. So April. First, 2020, we all know what happened in 2020. Like, there's nobody that doesn't know what happened in 2020, except you were born, like, you know, two years ago. Now, the pandemic yeah. hit. We're on a lockdown, right? And so, um, at this point, a friend of mine gives me a phone, an iPhone 7, and that's that was the most expensive thing I had at the time. And... On the 5th of July, 2020, my life was about to change. Now, how did that happen? So you see, you know, Ryan, I was I was going to church that Sunday morning and I was sitting in the bus. And so I bring out my phone. This is a very special phone. I bring it out to, um, to use it, right? Because I want to check my social media. I want to check my Twitter followers. And so I bring it out and in a split second, right? Somebody just comes from outside the window, grabs the phone, and literally peels the phone out of my hand, right? And I just watched in horror, like, as the guy just wow. disappeared into the darkness. Like, you know, for, the, for like two weeks, three weeks after that incident, I kind of had like, you know, PTSD. I'll be walking on the road and I'll just be, I'll see people using their phones and I'll be terrified. I'll be like, like, don't you know what can happen? Don't you know that, you know, you could lose your phones and all that stuff? But you see, in that moment when that right. stuff happened, I remember walking to church that day. I don't have a phone. Um, you know, my friend is beside me. He, he he witnessed when the whole thing happened. And I remember asking myself the question that changed my life. I said, Bruno, what can you do right now? And that's why I love the power of questions. I feel like, which one version we're going to dive into, but... I asked myself a question. I said, Bruno, what can you do right now that will change your life? What can you do right now that can make you money? And I mean, when nice. I was in, when I was working a nine to five, I would have just I, I wouldn't have thought to answer the question. The scenario, the the um, the circumstances that made that question very powerful were not there. So it would have made sense. To ask mm-hmm. me that question then, but now asking myself that question now made all the difference because now I just realized that I was in a freaking pandemic. I cannot apply for a job, right? I don't have a phone. But you want to know the? Yeah. Do you want to know the the greatest realization that I had in that moment? What's that? So. It was then I realized that when people talk about being broke, it was then I realized that being broke is not 
It's not a lack of money, right? That's not what it means to be broke. I mean, I was listening to a, 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 mm. a, a podcast, I think it's a podcast, or an interview by Dan Gote, who's like the richest African in the world, all right? And Dan Gote was saying that he didn't have any money with him. The, 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 the interviewer asked him and was like, there's no money with me, right? And so that lets you know that being broke is not about not having money. Being broke is about not having the ability to make money on demand. That's what it means to be mm. broke. That you do not have the ability, the capacity, the, you know, the ideas, the experience, the skill to create money on demand. And, you know, I, I came to that realization that I was broke not because I didn't have money. I was broke because... I didn't have anything in my head. And that's when I decided to change my life. And that's when I decided that I was going to empty my pockets to fill my head. Because my mentor once told me something. He said, if you empty your pockets to fill your head, one day your head will end up filling your pockets. And this, that's a very powerful story. Nice. Cool. Yeah, I like that. And so, you know, I started, I went into marketing, then, you know, went into sales. Because I realized that at the end of the day, I need to be able to convince somebody else to give me the money in their pocket. And if I could do that very well, if I could do that, you know, the better I could do that, the more money I could make. So Cool. I love that, man. There's a lot there for sure. I, um, I love what you said, too, about like um, the asking yourself questions, like how important that is. Like, I think I've heard it said, I, I forget who said it, but I read something recently about like, the quality or the trajectory of your life can be determined by the quality of questions that you ask yourself. And that actually inspired me to write a, a short Twitter thread that I, I wrote like last week or the week before that. Um, and just outlining some of the best questions that you can, you can ask yourself. Right. Um, and it did pretty well. Like when I, I don't get like, you know, too much traction on Twitter, but it was one of my more popular ones. So I think that's spot on. Okay. And I think that's uh, that's something that I haven't heard many people say until like lately, but it seems to be a recurring theme for whatever reason lately. But also that idea of like, you're not broke um, when you have zero dollars, it's a matter of uh, whether or not you can generate that income, right? And exactly. that comes down to multiple things, I think, right? It's kind of like what Alex Ramosi says about uh, skills, traits, and beliefs, right? Um, and that kind of all comes to, to play there, right? You, and especially skills, obviously, but even if you do have the skill, you have to believe in yourself enough to be able to like, go ask people for money to perform said, mm -hmm. that skill. Right. So it all comes to, to a head there. So, um, what drew you to, to, um, seek ways to make money online? So you got started in affiliate marketing. Um, what drew you to that? Well, to be honest, man, I don't have like a very uh, grand story apart from what I told you. What happened that moment was that I realized when my phone was stolen that a few days ago, right, a friend of mine had told me about this online business that I could do and make money. And I didn't want to do it because I hated marketing and sales. But now I don't have money. I don't have a phone. I don't have a, I don't have a way out. And I needed to make a way out. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do affiliate marketing. Let me just even see what's it about, right? And that's when I decided that, okay, I'm just going to check it out and see what they have. Like, I, I wasn't really sold on the idea. I just wanted to see what it was about. And that's when everything began to change. Why did you hate marketing and sales? Very good question, man. And, and it kind of leads me to, you know, understanding, like, when it comes to so let me give you the background, right? So the first time I actually started marketing, it was terrible, man. It was terrible. So what happened was that I I was a, a teenager then. And so my pastor asked us to go sell newspapers, all right? And so when the sun, really, really hot sun, man. Like, like Brandon, if you're in Africa, you know that the sun is really hot. So it's it's scorching. The sun is scorching, and we have to chase. We have to chase, you know, cars, and get them to actually buy newspapers, which is not really like a need or a necessity. It's kind of like a one and a half, right? And so it was terrible. My 
Now, looking back with the eyes of marketing and sales, I knew why I hated it because that was, a, that was the wrongest way to go into marketing, right? And so because of that, I just felt like, why do you have to persuade people to do stuff? Like, just let people be. Like, why are you trying to force people to do stuff, right? If they don't want to do it, then let them not do it. That was my thinking about sales and marketing. And uh, I think all that gotcha. began to change when I really began to understand about influence, persuasion, psychology, and what it really meant to sell. So it felt like you, you were trying to sell people stuff that they didn't really need. It was just kind of something that was unnecessary. Exactly. That was your first experience with exactly. it anyway. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what changed your mind about it? I read a book. Five, five years before the incident, I read a book. It was titled Influence the Psychology of Persuasion by Dr. Robert Cialdini. That's a that's a deep book. Oh, it's a big one. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a deep one, man. Like I remember reading that book and I was like, holy shit, like like this is crazy. Like it felt like I was given a superpower. Because now I could persuade people to do the stuff I wanted to do, and they didn't and, and it didn't feel like persuasion. It felt like they wanted to do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. In a way it is a superpower. It, it is a superpower. It, um, it's it's not just for sales, right? It's for every facet of your life, for dating, for being a parent, for um, you know, job interviews, like it'll improve every area of your life. Exactly. Absolutely. What made you read the book? So basically what happened was that I was in uh I was in I was on campus, right? And so while I was on campus, um my friend is sending some documents. And, you know, he has a bunch of PDFs. And he's like, hey, man, um, check out this PDF. You know, you might probably like it and all. And I'm like, okay. So he sends me a couple of books. I, I can't remember the rest of them, but I remember there were two of them. The first one was Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, right? The second one was Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. So I remember trying to read uh, Thinking, and the book is, like, really, really deep. You know, it's, it's like core psychology and stuff. It didn't really appeal to me then, but I decided to read, you know, Influence, and I was like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And, you know, I, I, I kind of, like, started practicing it then, but it wasn't until when I started affiliate marketing that the information consolidated itself. Because then you could apply it. Yeah. Okay. So affiliate marketing was kind of your start um, with your online business ventures, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, can you briefly describe what exactly affiliate marketing is for anybody that doesn't know? All right. So basically, affiliate marketing is just that, you know, um, so you know how there are products you've tried, services you've tried. For example, we are on uh, Riverside.fm studio, right? Wait, that's the app we're using and stuff like that. Now, if you have a good experience with them, right? You can tell somebody about it. I'm like, hey, man, if you're trying to, you know, do a podcast, stuff like this, you can literally have a podcast with somebody else, out, you know, across the world, and it's done, it's, it's amazing. So you tell them about your experience, right? Now, if let's say there was, um, um, let's say there was some financial uh, attachments to this, right? And somebody's like, okay, cool, I want to go into podcast. I like what you told me. I trust you. And then they click on your link, all right? And then they sign up on the podcast or they sign up on this app. These guys, Riverside FM, will be able to trace that you brought in that customer and then they will be more than happy to pay you for bringing in that customer. So it's like a referral fee. Yeah, I can think of it like that, yes. So you started with affiliate marketing and eventually you moved into more of like a remote sales, remote closer job. Um, how did you make that leap? So I remember thinking, like, in my industry where we were, I, I remember thinking, like, it was becoming, because, you know, for a beginner, when you hear, oh, you can literally start XYZ business and you can start making a lot of money, it appeals to you, right? But the problem with that is that if everybody can start it, then all of a sudden you're going to wake up one day and you have, like, a ton of competition, right? So it got to a point where I would go on Facebook and I would see people using my story to run ads for their webinar, for their sales. And it was crazy, right? So I was thinking like, I need to create a market of one or I need to do something 
that will be hard for others to copy, or the you know the, the competition is going to be stiff. So a lot of people are going to quit, and ultimately, it's something that puts me in control of my finances. Because for affiliate marketing, you have to run like Facebook ads, you have to do this, you have to do that. So most affiliates are, they are like a jack of all trades, but they are master of none. They, they don't have one thing that say, this is my core skill. This is the one thing I know how to do. And so that's what I wanted to be able to say. I wanted to be able to say that, listen, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this fairly well. But if you give me a prospect that's qualified, I'm going to be able to sell to them. I wanted to be able to say that. And so that's what led me. So I got a training, I got a you know a coaching program, and I started learning, and I was like, okay, you know, like this makes sense. Then I no then I noticed the problem, right? Most of the coaching programs are pretty expensive for people in this part of the world to um to take a part of and it's not because i mean it's just because here in africa the currency is lower you know poverty is high and all of all of that stuff but we have really really intelligent brilliant people from nigeria i mean if you check the world some of the when, when people from nigeria go to the universities you know outside nigeria they are probably one of the best graduating students almost all the time so we have the talents, we have the skills, we have the drive. We just needed the information. So I was like, you know what? I've done this. I've done it for myself. And I can help this specific set of people. All right? And of course, obviously, anybody. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, you know, help people. While I'm doing it, all right? So I'm still closing. I'm still getting on calls, uh, closing deals. But I'm now taking my experience and I'm making that, uh, I'm making the journey shorter for somebody else. And that's how Community of Closers was born. Gotcha. Cool. So you hit on two interesting elements there, in my mind anyway. And one was in the beginning you were talking about um, essentially the barrier to entry of any type of business venture, right? And it's kind of a double-edged sword, if you will, because the barrier of entry is for a lot of businesses – um, is what prevents a lot of people from being able to do entrepreneurship themselves. So they're frustrated because they can't break into anything. But on the flip side, you need at least some type of barrier to entry for any type of business venture because, like you said, then the problem becomes that it, the competition swarms in very fast. It gets super saturated, and then there's just a race to the bottom, essentially. Exactly. Um, so it, barrier to entry is a very interesting um, you know, element of business, I think. Yeah. And it's something that I've been reflecting on a lot lately. Um, it, just because of some of the things that I'm doing, um, recently with my like e-com ventures and that kind of thing. And just the, the idea of like quote unquote passive income and how there's like a barrier to entry mm -hmm. to that, right? Like you can't really, I heard one of my favorite entrepreneurs recently say, um, that you can't get passive income without, you know, at least a hundred thousand dollars to invest and in large part, like that's kind of true, you know, because you have to have that money to make, you know, work for you. The money makes money for you in a way. Um, but, you know, there are ways that you that you can break into business with very little or even no money um, up front by using other people's money and all that kind of stuff. So that was one thing I thought you mentioned that was pretty interesting. And then the other thing um with regards to creating community of closers to teach Nigerians the skills that they need in order to um, become remote closers. Interestingly, it's not just Nigerians. It's, it's like it's starting from Nigeria, right? It's like we can help these people. So, so there's, something, there's, a, there's something that happened uh, a couple of years back. I think that was five, ten years ago. So a couple of guys came together and they taught people how to code, right? They they like they helped Nigerians, young Nigerians, learn how to code. I think the names names Andela or something. And so what what they found out was that they had this hub of really really talented code, coders, right? So people would come in, they learn how to build apps, build website, build all this stuff, and then they started exporting those talents. And that's why I mean, if you want people who can code, even code as better as good as foreign uh, U.S. Uh, coders. You have Nigerians who can actually do that stuff, right? So they, it kind of like closed the education gap because 
the more educated a country is, the more educated the people are, the more um, the better the economy overall, and the more money that can circulate in the economy. So, um, yes, so we are starting from Africa, but we're not. It's not just for Nigerians, right? It's Nigeria to like the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where I was going with that is, you know, that was your beginning niche, if you will, your beginning niche, and you're addressing a, a gap in the market because um, maybe I, at least the way that I interpreted what you said is that um, you noticed that Nigerians didn't have access to that information um, in a way that was like affordable or accessible to them. And so that was the problem that you're solving as an entrepreneur. Yeah, that was one of the reasons. The main reason I found out was that from my experience, and because, I mean, I was in marketing before I went to sales, it felt to me like Nigerians didn't really know how to sell. Like, a lot of people don't know how to sell, pardon me, right? But it felt like specifically, we didn't understand how this type of sales worked. And so it's because it's very nuanced. It's very different from your, you know, Wolf of Wall Street type of sale where you're trying to beat the prospect into submission and all of that. Like, it's it's totally different. And right. I mean, today I was on a call with uh, somebody who was interested and you know, I asked him, so if you were to sell, like, I gave him a scenario and I, and I tried to test him, man. With the way he was speaking, I told him, like, hey, man, like, if you say this and you reply like this, like these people are going to eat you up. Like, they're going to, you're not going to close anybody like this. And you see that, you know, on average, on like, you know, when it comes to coding, it's really, it's a bit, it's a bit more accessible than, you know, this information. Because, I mean, if you were to learn it from the US or, you know, outside the US, you probably have to be like five, six, seven, eight K, right? To learn it. Or, you know, if it's very cheap, then it's three, four yeah. K. But most Nigerians can afford that, so we try mm -hmm. to do something about that. Yeah. Yeah, so that was the gap in the market that you kind of you're addressing. And then, you know, you're expanding from there, if you will. So if you had to do it all over again, would you change anything about the way that you you broke into the online world of business? To be honest, I, I'm, now you're asking that question, I'm actually thinking of it. Right? Maybe I would have... When I started with affiliate marketing, I would have doubled down on his skill instead of just being like a generalist, right? I would have said, you know what, I actually want to I want to make this my skill, all right? And then became better at it. But I it, I have one of those rare stories where I started out and immediately I started making money because the timing was right. I had, you know, the things that I needed to hmm. succeed, I was, I was already doing them before I needed before I knew I needed them. So, for example, um, I wasn't running ads, but I was selling. Why? Because I had built an audience, and that's why that's why I understand the power of building an audience. I built an audience of people who trusted me. And so when I recommended this new product and service, they bought it, right? They, 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 all, bought, they all bought it, and they were glad they did, right? So at uh, the time, it was right, because this was when people were looking at online businesses, um the the market was actually down, right and then it was so it wasn't really our you know it was to be honest looking back at it sometimes i feel like i was lucky and i i don't say this you know i, I like to own the fact that there was an element of luck in it because i was just at the right place at the right time the right market at the right time. yeah but the fact that i took advantage of that is something else and um what that helped me do was to build confidence because what, what, what psychologists have found out and human behavior specialists have found out is that people who get an early win, all right, in a venture when they're starting out something, tend to do better overall than people who don't get an early win, all right, because that early win is more like a sweet taste in the mouth and they're able to stay for the main, you know, for the main, uh, for the main result. And so that early win for me was, was, right. was very important. So to be honest, I think the only thing I would like to change would be to double down on um, on what was working and just focus on, in, on on becoming good at one skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not have shiny object syndrome, basically, and just uh, really hone your skills in one thing. It's easier said than done, for sure. It's, but it was interesting to me that you, you st started talking about, like, the timing was right. And then you related that pretty, pretty quickly to like being lucky. But I think that, um, 
it made it made me think immediately of a, a quote. I can't remember. It's actually a famous philosopher that says that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So, yeah, I mean, opportunity comes and goes all the time. But if you're if you're not there ready for it, when the opportunity presents itself, you're, you're not going to be able to capitalize. Right. So it could just be that, you know, you, you were prepared, you know, not long before opportunity met where it where you needed to be. Um, but for the people that feel like they're, they're missing it, you have to keep putting in the work. You have to keep being there. And, and eventually, um, you'll, you'll get your turn. You'll get your chance. Um, it's kind of the way that I think about it. So if you, if you were to talk to somebody that was interested in, in breaking into entrepreneurship now, um, but weren't sure how to get started, what would you say to them? How would you direct them? That's a good question because I was talking to somebody just a few days ago and that was the exact question we're trying to um, to solve. So if I also talk to somebody, I'll tell them that the first thing they will need to learn is sales, right? Like you don't make money, you earn it, right? You have to persuade somebody else who has the money to give you that money. No, I mean, you're not, you don't print money. Anybody, nobody prints money. All right, you just have to know how to persuade somebody else to give you the money that's in your pocket. So if I also talk to somebody who wants to start entrepreneurship, wants to become an entrepreneur, I'll say the first commandment of being an entrepreneur is that you must know how to sell stuff. You must know how to sell yourself, sell your ideas, sell a product, sell a service. You just need, you need to know how to sell Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's funny sometimes when I'll, I'll, I'll see people that are interested in entrepreneurship or business in general, but they're like, oh, I'm not a salesman. And I'm like, dude, you're trying to build a business. You're going to have to be a salesman. Exactly. It's, that comes right. with the, right. the, the territory. You, you know? have to be a salesman. Yeah. And to that point, a lot of very famous, ultra successful entrepreneurs got their start in sales, right? Like guys like Gary Vee or Mark Cuban, et cetera. Um, so wh why do you think that is? Why is sales a good spot to start? Well, because it's very hard, right? Uh, and it's, so let me, let, me, let me rephrase that. It's not very hard. It's, it's nuanced, right? By the end of the day, it's about people. It's people that are going to give you the money and that you want. The money you want is in the pockets of other people. And everybody in the world, even the ones who are not salespeople, every business in the world is run by sales. And sales is beyond just, beyond just business. Like every time you are communicating to somebody to get them to take an action, you're selling, you're persuading them, right? And really what sales is, is effective communication. You're basically just knowing how to communicate what you want effectively in a way that the other person does it, you know, the way you want it to be done or, you know, does what you're asking to be done. And if you can persuade one person, you can persuade 10. If you can persuade 10, you can persuade a million. If you can persuade a million, you can persuade the whole world. That's why, you know, you can be good at sales and then you can be good at leadership. And then that, you know, it's like, it's like water. You can take water, you put it in food, you can cook it. You take water, you can use it to wash clothes. You can take water, you can use it to, you know, add it to a brick or cement and you can build a house. Sales is like water for entrepreneurship, right? Anything you want to, if you're going to succeed in life, you must know how to sell. Yeah, so that's yeah absolutely. You don't really have it. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so that's why, to answer your question, you know, why some of the successful entrepreneurs are people that started in sales. Because if you do it long enough, you begin to understand people in a very, very, very interesting way. And you can then build on top of that. Yeah, absolutely. You don't, you don't have a business if you're not getting money in, right? Like you, you can geek out on your product or your service all day, but if you don't have the ability um, to sell it, then there, there is no business, That's period. Right. <laughs> it's just a weird hobby at that point, I guess. Um, you, what do you, um, what do you think or, or say about the idea that, um, cause I think of this as like kind of very much like a scarcity mindset, like in order to make money, you kind of have to take it to some, from somebody else, that idea that there's like, you know, a pie and you're in order to get more money for yourself, you have to take more of somebody else's slice of the pie. Um, 
Do you do you believe that this, that's the case, or do you think of it differently? No, I, I don't think you are taking from somebody else's slice of the pie, bro. Money is infinite, man. You see this thing, the paper we call money, which is not really money, but that paper, that currency, it's infinite. The, you can go ask the banks, like, they could literally print as much as they want, all right? But really, what is finite is the ability to create value, all right, and to solve problems for people. Listen, if you're solving someone's problem, that is the real value. The paper money is just a representation of the amount of value they perceive that their problem is. So you would probably buy aspirin for like, you know, I don't know, 10 bucks, 100 bucks, I don't know, right? But you will pay way more to solve cancer, to treat cancer, right? Why? This reason is simple, right? Aspirin, my, uh, a headache or a pain, you know, that pain you're experiencing might not be life-threatening, but cancer is life-threatening. So I value my life more than this, right? And so I would pay more money than that. At the end of the day, it's about finding problems and solving those problems in a new, unique way, innovative way. And that's where entrepreneurship is, right? And being able to persuade somebody else about the solution of that problem. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's you. You hit the nail on the head in terms in terms of like what I would say anyway is that yeah, I'm, the fiat currency that we use is is actually not backed by anything. It's backed by the full faith and credit of the government. And you mentioned earlier, ironically, in the podcast that nobody prints money. And I thought to myself, well, the, the government is the only I one mean, that prints money. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and then when they do that, they actually rob your purchasing power via inflation. But so it's not like it's without a cost. Right. But um, what the question was, is about that idea of like that scarcity mindset where it's like if you want to make money, you have to take from somebody else. That's actually not how our monetary system works. Money is being created literally all the time. It's like constantly going up and up and up. Every time a bank makes a new loan, for instance, that's money that's literally created out of thin air. That's A. And then B is whenever an entrepreneurship or bleh, whenever an entrepreneur enters a space and starts adding value, providing a product or service that solves a problem to that space, exactly. um, it's not like you're you're taking people's slices of the pie away. You're actually making the pie bigger for everybody because you're providing value to the world. So anyway, I just and if you think about it, nobody nobody has money. Right, except maybe like very broke people, and that's why they're probably broke. And no offense to you if you're watching this, but nobody takes money and eats it, right? Nobody does that. Nobody takes money and cooks it, right? Nobody takes money and sleeps on it. So at the end of the day, money is just there to help us get the things that we really want. And that is why we would buy those things. Because in our minds, the things we're paying for is more valuable than the money that we have in our pockets. That is the point, And that yeah. is why we buy things. So if somebody is solving a problem for me, and I'm saying that, oh, you know, think about Facebook, right? Before there was Facebook, before this application, before all of this stuff, right? People had money. And then Facebook came and then provide a value, and then found a way to monetize that value in such a crazy way. And now they're making more money, and people don't feel bad about it. People are throwing their money to Facebook. So you're not taking out of the pie. Yeah. That's a wrong mindset. You're increasing the pie, right. right? You're providing value for somebody, and you're making the world a better place. 100% agree, man. So while we're on the topic of, of myths and misconceptions, um, because sales and marketing is your thing, what, what's your least favorite myth or misconception with regards to, say, sales or marketing? My least favorite misconception is that. So, you know, there's this, there's this thing where people think that, um, you know, they want to hop on new trends, new software, this, that, all of that stuff. And... Man, I wouldn't say I've been around for a long time. I haven't, right? 
but I, I, I'm, I'm a student of human behavior, and I'll tell you this, right? 5,000 years, 10,000 years, and we as a species have not changed. We haven't. We still have the same fears. We still have the same desires. We still have the same wants. We still have the same limitations, right? And for every time something solves that problem, a new problem is created, right? So what I'm basically saying is that mediums, you know, I see a lot of people wanting to learn about this medium, learn about this new trick. At the end of the day, sales is about understanding people and what makes them tick, all right? And being able to communicate in such a way that people do what you want them to do and they feel like it's their choice. So I think most yeah. people should focus on understanding human behavior and, you know, psychology and what makes people really tick. And trying to learn about this new trick, this new technique and all of that, like just zero in on people and go back to the fundamentals and the basics of what makes people tick, right? Why do we buy the things we buy? Why do we do the things yeah. we do? Why do we want one thing and we don't want the other thing, right? Why do we pay more money for something that's expensive and we don't want to buy? Like all those little things helps you understand people. Because when you understand, because you cannot, and here's the saying I, li I, I love so much. I don't know where I heard it from, but it's so beautiful. I tell my students that you cannot influence, you cannot persuade that which you don't understand. Yeah, I like to think of sales as um, essentially leading somebody to come to their own conclusion about how to solve their problem. Exactly. And that ideally is with your product or service, right? Exactly. And it's via questioning them. Um, I think that's the most effective way to persuade anybody is to um, lead them and help them come to their own conclusion about something. Um, even when I was a personal trainer back in, when I was in college, um, I, I knew that like intuitively, like I, that I needed to help people realize it themselves. If I just literally told them what to do, it didn't have the same impact. So I had to like make them realize. Yeah. I had to make that light bulb go off for them. And it's the same thing with sales. You have to like, if you just, you know, beat them over the head with the product or with the features and benefits, it's, I mean, that's old school that might've worked back in the day, but that it's not very effective anymore. Um, so with regards to that, interestingly, right. Just like to digress, uh, there's this movie I saw, it's called Inception and it's by Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, in this movie, the idea of the movie is that at the beginning was that they go and they steal stuff from your mind using dreams. And I felt like, you know, I watched that movie before, but when I entered sales and marketing and, you know, started understanding human behavior, I realized that. It was a pretty interesting movie. So I had to go watch it again with a different mindset. And in one of the scenes, you know, the, the goal shifted from trying to steal information to trying to implant ideas, right? And to shift beliefs. And that's what really the, the point of inception is, that you plant an idea so deep in someone's mind that they do not realize that the idea is not their own. Because if I tell you to do something, your mind can trace the fact that it's not for, it's not originally your thought, right? But uh -huh. if you perform Inception according to the movie, the person wakes up from this dream and they just want to do this thing, right? Because of the, the way it has been planted. And that's really what you know, sales, and, sales and marketing has to be, right? We are constantly yeah. shifting people's beliefs in such a way, influencing them and persuading them in such a way that it feels so germane and it feels like it's theirs, right? The, most, the two most effective ways I've found to do that is through storytelling and through asking questions. Those are like the two best ways to do that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's super interesting, man. I never thought of Inception as a sales or marketing movie before. I watched that, you know, like a decade ago or whatever. And that was well before I ever touched any material with regards to sales or marketing. So now I'm going to have to go back and watch oh, it because yeah, yeah. you make an excellent point there. <laughs> Definitely, man. Like I, I watched it again and I was like, huh, you know, the guy did say something and I was, I, 
I don't want to like go deep into the movie, but there was really a point where they were trying to, you know, generate some level of it was it was to be honest, if you go back and watch the movie, it'll make more sense than actually me saying it, but there was a point where they were trying to shift the guy's emotions and feelings towards his dad. And they said that, you know, they had to use positive emotions, right? And they had to ensure that those emotions felt real. All right. They had because positive emotions are stronger than like negative emotions in terms of actions, right? So what what that made me realize was that if we if we can elicit the right kind of emotion in people, you know, in conversations, you know, basically when we communicate with them, we can have a long lasting effect on their behavior or on the decisions they make. It was I mean it was really a cool uh moment of epiphany, but you know yeah, if you go watch it, it'll make more sense. Yeah, for sure, man. That's, you're really selling me on this movie. I gotta watch it again. Because it's it's that idea, too, of um, people buy on emotion and justify with logic, right? Yeah. Um, the, how important that um, emotional, you know, more animal primitive brain is to the whole buying process. So, all right, next question. What is So, are you familiar with the 80 20 rule? Yeah, Pareto yeah principle? the Pareto principle, yes. It's uh, the idea that for anybody listening, the, the idea that 80% of your results come from 20% of your actions. So that basically there's certain actions you take that are more important than others, right? Um, so like a, a, an example that I give all the time is like SEO. It was one of the first skills that I kind of really got into and got good at. And with SEO, there's like tons of stuff that you can do to rank a web website, right? There's all kinds of technical stuff. There's website speed, there's H1 tags, there's alt tags, all kinds of stuff. It's really geeky and boring. But two, the two most important things that you do in SEO to rank a website is content and backlinks. If you do those two things, your website's going to rank. It's going to start moving up the rankings. You can do all the rest of the stuff to try to like beat out the competition and get the, that little extra edge, if you will. But those are the most important actions that you take for SEO. So what do you think, in your opinion, is the 80-20 rule of sales? Um, for instance, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about the different facets and skills that are involved in sales. So things like building rapport or um, objection handling, probing all that kind of stuff. What, in your opinion, is most important? Yeah, being able to ask the right questions and to really listen. Yeah, that one, I th so yeah, that one's probably a little bit underrated, the, that skill or um, idea of active listening, if you will. And I think that that's intrinsically like tied to um, empathy. Yeah. You know, being able to exactly. actually understand somebody. Yeah. This idea that like you're, you're, you're listening not so that you're um, thinking of the next thing that you're going to say, but you're listening just genuinely to understand the other person. Yeah, it's back to the same thing we said. You cannot persuade that which you don't understand. Okay, here's, here's one that I like to ask a lot of people, um, that especially people that have you know, an interest or skills in sales and marketing. But, and there's no right answer to this question, obviously. But if you had to choose one, what's more important, sales or marketing? That's pretty tough, man. But, um, sales are like... It's meant to be tough, yeah. <laughs> to, to be honest, you need both, right? Like, why do I have to choose one, though? Because you need both. You need both to win the war, right? So sales are like foot soldiers. You need them to actually go in there and, you know, really take on the hostage and all that. Marketing is like, you know, the bombs that you throw, right? So you can throw bombs and all that, but you still need men on the ground to do the stuff, right? But the men on the ground also need the bombs to kind of like, you know, make the work easier because sales is like, you know, I was talking to somebody, you know, for the company I work with and it's like sales is supposed to be the extension of marketing, right? So if, if marketing is good, sales become easy. Yeah, absolutely. They're definitely, definitely linked. You can't really have one without the other or be good at one without being good at the other or at least it's understanding the, it on some level. Marketing. I forget which... Um, if you're good at marketing and you're bad at sales, you'll be wasting your money. If you're good at sales and you and you and you're yeah. bad at marketing, you'll be wasting your energy and your time. Yeah, for sure, that's so, a good way to look so at it. Which one do you want? I forget which. Um, there's a there's a legendary marketer that said something along the lines of like, mark the purpose of marketing is to make sales unnecessary, and I, I, I think, think that speaks uh, to the idea of how linked they are. I think it's Peter Drucker. 
you know, was it? I think it's Peter Drucker. I, I don't. Okay. I, I think it's. I was gonna say like Ogilvy or Eugene Schwartz or something. I, I don't. I, I I've never had it, but be not. But yeah, but it's, yeah. Um, okay, so what do you think the the future of entrepreneurship will look like? Um, the reason I ask that is because. We live in a day and age where it's never been easier to start your own business. You could go on LegalZoom.com and throw up the the, um, the actual entity. You can build a website, buy the domain, run the ads even, do all this stuff within a day's time, whereas that in the past would have been completely impossible. Um, so it's very easy to start it, and it's also easy to gain access to information Relatively speaking, right? Compared to you know past decades and stuff, it's easy to gain access to information about what to do and how to do it. Um, but we also have things um, coming down the pike in the future, things like artificial intelligence, um, robotics, automation in general, that is um, threatening a lot of industries and disrupting a lot of things. And so what, in your opinion, is it going to look like? Do you think that there's always going to be a space for entrepreneurship and that creative human touch or do you think that like ai for instance like a lot of people are thinking about is going to replace like almost everything i mean i think ai will definitely help but at the end of the day man again like i've not been around for a long time but i can tell you from what i know that the, the things that the things so as some things become more accessible so think about the information age First of all, you know, people who had the information became those who ruled the world, right? And soon, the internet democratized information and everybody had information now. Everybody, like, literally from the push of a button could get access to information. So having information stopped being the edge, right? It was now people with specialized information and people who could implement the information that they had, right? So as more things become easily accessible, just like the barrier of entry, the things that can't scale, all right, the things that can't be automated, the things that AI cannot do really become more valuable. Things like creative thinking, things like focus, discipline, you know, things like, you know, being able to, yeah, focus and discipline. All these things will always, always be valuable. All right, and they'll be valuable in different forms, different formats. Like, you know, when you mix them, creativity creativity with, you know, being able to be focused and disciplined, you could have, like, a different output entirely, right, with your personality. So, ideally, it is people who know what to do and then know how to get the AI to do the things they want to do that would win. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, being just being able to execute in the physical world is the advantage that we have over AI like ChatGPT right now, right? The, the problem, I think, though, with that is that what happens when robotics really takes off? Then will that AI be able to be linked to robotics and execute certain things in the physical world? Um, it seems like robotics is, like, lagging way behind AI. Um, so maybe there's a big gap there, some more time. Um, but the, it was interesting because I saw a Twitter thread. I don't know if you saw this on Twitter the other day, but there was this guy that basically told chat GPT that he's that you're now hustle GPT yeah, and so your your goal is to take my $100 yeah and turn it into as much money as possible and so he's on like day seven of the journey or whatever but the the AI was teaching him to buy like a domain and build a business and it was like this niche website about like eco-friendly kitchen utensils or it. something oh, weird like that but he's all yeah yeah, it was very interesting, but it, it's kind of that flip, like a lot of people, when ChatGPT came out, like a lot of people were like, this is perfect because now they're going to be my virtual assistant, but it's, he flipped it around and was like, all right, ChatGPT is going to be the brains and I'm going to be the human assistant to the brains, like the, that, that's the entrepreneur brain and then I'm just going to go execute everything that it says to do. Yeah, yeah, that is for sure right there, absolutely. I think there will always be room for a human touch too, though. There, I think there, that like, there would always be um, like, it, like sales, for instance. Sales is going to be. No, no. I, I was going to. I was thinking. Do you think that AI will replace a salesman? I was thinking that it's going to take. It's going to take time, man. Like, see. So here's the thing. You see, 
maybe low quality salespeople, very maybe simple sales process. Maybe AI might replace it, but I am currently having this offer that we're selling and the process is so nuanced, right? You have to be able to get the right tonality and everybody's different. Everybody's different, right? And so that means that truly good salespeople are creative people, which AI might not really have right now or it might take a very long time before they get there. And so at the end of the day, if you're, yes, I believe AI will replace salespeople, but it's be the poor salespeople. Really good salespeople, AI won't replace them. They'll, be, they'll know how to sell the AI to companies that need the AI. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, the sales that nobody wants to do really, like low ticket B2C uh, business to consumer stuff, um, let AI replace that all day anyway. So, you know, who cares? Because the, the commission there is so low that nobody cares. Um, but it makes me think of like, did you ever see that video? It, it came out like actually like four or five years ago where it was Google's AI and they were demonstrating it where they had the AI call, like, I forget, it was like a, a hair salon or something like that and booked an appointment for somebody. And you couldn't tell at all that the, the person was talking to an AI because they even did little, like, little little things where they would go mm-hmm and things like that and they responded appropriately so the person on the other end who was a human that was booking the appointment had no idea that they were talking to an ai um and it, that just makes me think of like okay so what what happens when like that ai is going to be leveraged and used to do cold calling you know and be the salesman um so i think that the the that that will happen, you no, know, no. but I also think that there will be resistance from people who are buying, yeah. like they won't want to buy from a robot because oh. there isn't enough trust there. There isn't like true empathy in that human touch. So remember that, remember that really the, the things that makes humanity work, that makes business work are really intangible. And one of them is trust, right? You cannot say, I mean, the only way you can say, I trust this person is the level of action, sacrifices, and things you're willing to do for that person you trust. So when these AI take over, it's, what's going to happen is that trust will just keep diminishing. And so people who have built relationships, people who have personal brands, people who have credibility, who have been doing this for a long time, will only get much more valuable because now everybody knows that they've been doing it for a long time. So as as AI democratizes things, certain things become more... Because that's how human humanity works. When things become scarce, they become valuable. So for whatever AI is making available, yeah. what, is, what, what is... By AI making certain things available, certain things are becoming more scarce. And those things that are becoming more scarce are now becoming more valuable. And it's it's just how it's going to work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, you just you just gave me a little bit of a light bulb moment there about you know, the importance of a personal brand. Um, not that I, like, I didn't think that it was important before, but um, I'm sure you... Have you ever heard it said that we live in um, the lowest trust society like ever? Yeah. Have you ever heard yeah, somebody say heard, that? People, of course. Of it. Yeah, so what you just said, like... Yeah. So what you just said, like, if, if that's the case, if that's true, where we do live in the lowest trust society ever, and it's going to be in the future where, like, if you have that personal brand, that that's obviously key is that you have that trust element with your audience. Um, the idea of having that becomes literally, I think, actually invaluable, like literally invaluable exactly. at that point. So just kind of blew my mind there for a minute. I, I never made that connection until you just said that. And, and that's just it. Like, the more, it's, the more it's making certain things available, certain things become more scarce, then the scarce things become more valuable. And the, one, the people who have the abundance of the scarce things become like the most valuable of, this, of the set. So, yeah, AI could go ahead and democratize things, but... The people who have been doing it and who are doing it and who are getting results will only get valuable. Because people will say, these guys have been doing it way longer before they came in here, right? 
and they know what's working and it's still for sure. working for them. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. All right, man, with that, we're, we're heading towards the hour here. So I'm going to start trying to wrap it up. So Bruno, where can people find you if they want to know more about you or they can use your services? So basically just go to Bruno underscore Wogu. That's B-R-U-N-O underscore N-W-O-G-U on all social media platforms, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. You find me. Yeah. And I'll, I'll link your stuff and also the community closes website. I'll link that in the description for the podcast. So guys, if you're out there, you're listening to this podcast, you're thinking about making the leap from employee to entrepreneur, uh, sales is a great place to start. Marketing is a great place to start. And I highly, highly encourage you to do it, to jump into sales, jump into marketing, start building your dreams because the world needs more entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs solve problems. And Lord knows we have enough problems. So join me, join Bruno, and we'll see you on the other side. Peace, guys.